Good evening, friends. So today uh, we are going to discuss something that is a bridge between knowledge and wisdom. We all toil with babies, and then what happens? Uh, usually, we know how it is to be done, but then when it comes to actual doing it, uh, there are issues we face. And do we have an interface? Yes, we have an interface. That is a point of care ultrasound. And uh, let's straight away go on to the topic. Discussions can happen at the end. So I would invite uh, Professor uh, Pradeep Suryavanshi to uh, uh, start with lecture. Fantastic. Um, uh, thank you, Manoj. I think uh, without wasting time, so let's start about the <clears throat> thought process. So what is the, our plan is to see that in the next 45 to 50 minutes about the point of care ultrasound as an emerging branch in the neonatology. And what we are going to see is basically, um, just I was discussing with Manoj, uh, the greetings from the Pune, India, and we were supposed to be the cap we were capital of India in 17th century. You all know about the great Shivaji Maharaj and Peshwas. So all, all welcome to the capital city of Pune whenever you're free. We will discuss about the various roles of point of care ultrasound in neonatology. And this is on the case based, what you do in your day-to-day -day practice. What you see, those are the ones, basically uh, you are managing those patients. And those patients, how this actually point of care ultrasound changes your management the point of care uh, ultrasound guides your management. That's the point we are going to see. And then we will see about some of the research angles, what we can think about point of care ultrasound. So what is the most important thing happened in the last two decades that the traditional important teaching will remain lifelong. We know that inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, that's the medical school teaching which will be there. But the insulation is added as a fifth pillar of our examination. So if you see now, most of the Western medical schools have included undergraduate insulation as a part of curriculum. And that is going to happen in India also as a part of our day-to-day -day practice. So what is the point of care ultrasound? The point of care ultrasound, that means you have some question in your mind. That question's answer is yes or no. You don't want to give 10 answers. It is just a simple question. Does the baby has the pulmonary hypertension? Does the baby has a PDA? That's a focus question. This is the ultrasound, which is a bedside. You know the problem, and it is a real-time ultrasound, what you see from the baby. These are the serial ultrasound for checking the functions of the baby and to find out pathophysiology. By doing this ultrasound bedside, you then get some answer as yes or no, and on that answer, you take the decision, do I need to treat this baby as a different way, which I'm already doing? So that is a target treatment. And once you've done the treatment, you also see the monitor, the response. That means you would like to see the response of that baby, and that is called as a clinician performed ultrasound, point of care ultrasound, What are the terms you give, that's are the various terminologies available in the last two decades. Now, the point of ultrasound sound is for diagnosis. When the baby gets crash, you know pericardial tamponade, pleural effusion, ascites, bleeds, those critical assessments you can do by point of ultrasound. sound. Naturally, the worsening baby, collapsed baby, shock baby. You also use the point of care for screening purposes, like IVH, hydrocephalus. You can prognosticate the babies. We'll discuss about the prognosis also. Most important is nowadays emerging thing is a procedure in therapeutic. And my main interest is now the current team of India should take lead in the research. Because as we all know, India has the future and the next 10 years, naturally, if we concentrate 
almost there are 90 seats of the dm and dn neurotology in india so that means we have almost thousands dm in the next 10 years so we should have minimum 1000 to 2000 international publication from this hemodynamics that could be the good for indian scenario so we all know as echocardiography and cranial ultrasound has been there for last two decades the last decade the gut ultrasound has been into the big big way the gut ultrasound Rima, can you mute? Uh, can you mute the people, please, uh, on behalf of me? So, the gut ultrasound, gut ultrasound has came out in the last five years. But I told you that the confirmation of the line position, or insertion of the line, or the tapping of the various fluids has also very important role of point of the ultrasound. And just I mentioned about the research, which is very important for all of us in our day-to-day -day practice. Now, what I told you that we have already working on these two questions last 20 years about hemodynamic signal PDA, pulmonary pressures, cardiac functions, pericardial effusions, and the preload problems are associations. We are also working on the cranial ultrasound since 1990s. And I also mentioned that now the lung ultrasound has become a backbone in each NIC. Very useful to differentiate for TTN and RDS. Fantastic sensitivity specificity for pneumothorax and pleural effusion. And the developing country like India, where you can diagnose pneumonia as early as possible. Definitely, you need to confirm the lines within five minutes, within one minute, as UAC, UVC, endotrical tube, and peak line position. You don't wait for x ray. And definitely, you confirm the fluid or associated hematosis in the gut ultrasound. These are the focus questions. So these focus questions are in your mind and you give the answer. Now with this one, let's see the situations. These are the day-to-day -day scenarios which we encounter in our practice. Now which we encounter in the practice, suppose this is a very common scenario in the medical school, what we see 34 weaker 1.4 kg, outbound referred on day six for apnea, bradycardia and hyperglycemia. Naturally, baby require ventilation with severe hypotension, poor perfusion, acidosis, high lactate. Now, you have done so many times, your diagnosing is correct, your approach is also most of the time correct, but how this ultrasound helps you? In these such type of patients, let's see this one patient, how the ultrasound is helped at various levels to me. Now, see, this is the ultrasound of this baby, which is showing severe TRJ and the MR jet. So these jets are very common in the babies with late onset gram negative sepsis in India. So what we documented in the literature also that these babies have a secondary pulmonary hypertension. This is a video showing the bidirectional PDA and that's also ultimate marker of pulmonary hypertension. So on this baby, on this basis, one of our one of our colleague, Dr. Deshpande, has documented this data about late onset neonatal sepsis and the pulmonary hypertension. What came out is that most of these babies of the late onset, especially gram negative sepsis, mainly moderate and late preterm babies have high pulmonary pressures. This was published in Journal of Ultrasound, Italian Journal, last year. And the pulmonary pressures were ranging from 35 to 45. And this is a secondary pulmonary hypertension in these babies as a hemodynamic disturbances. Also, what we saw in these babies, one of our DM candidate, Dr. Rima, what she observed that these babies have a bidirectional PDA. And these PDAs, you don't require treatment. Remember this word, very important. This is a bidirectional PDA. This is the classic bidirectional PDA. The right to left component more than 30%. This is not what you need to treat with endomethacin. Sorry, uh, in India, we don't have, but ibuprofen or paracetamol. Mostly, they close by 10 days of life, and all they will close by one month of life by proper ventilation, perfusion, your antibiotics, everything. And that's a marker of secondary pulmonary hypertension. So what we documented that the babies of late onset neonatal sepsis, especially gram-negative sepsis in the 
preterm babies they have this bidirectional pda that is reopened also what we documented that these babies have a very high cardiac output the normal cardiac output as you know is 150 to 250 ml per kg per minute and this baby's cardiac output has ranged from 350 to 450 ml per kg per minute so what we realized here we know that there is hypotension there is a high cardiac output ultimately there is a secondary pulmonary hypertension in these babies so this is one more study published by our team that high cardiac output in late onset neonatal sepsis especially gram negative sepsis range from 350 to 450 ml per kg per minute so there is high cardiac output there is a secondary pulmonary hypertension hypotension so these babies are vasodilatory shock what we know the formula of blood pressure as a cardiac output and what we know the svr so these babies svr is low they have vasodilatory shock they have a leaky shock that is what we also commented one more data collected by dr reema and dr arjun the third year dm residents what they saw that these babies ventricular function you see the ea ratio less than 1 right ventricular ea ratio is than 1 left ventricular ea ratio less than 1 the tapc and mapc was low and tissue doppler was also ample that means the babies with a gram negative sepsis mainly the preterm babies moderate late preterm and the very preterm babies have suffered ventricular dysfunction also so we talked about vasodilatation we talked about secondary pulmonary hypertension and we also documented that these babies are suffering from ventricular dysfunction that means this echo is helping me at various level to confirm what i am dealing with this one one of the data again collected by one of our dm candidate dr pari what you see in these babies have very minimal pericardial fluid you see this this is a, a subcostal view and there is a small pericardial fluid here this is what you can see the ascites in these babies and you have seen the pleural effusion that means these are the leaky babies as we know the third space loss which is common but we need to document that so these are the mainly babies which are acinobacter where there is a lot of leaks documented on day 3 and most of them they resolve by day 14 to day 28 again the treatment is same what you are doing so the documentation of this pericardial minimal pericardial effusion minimal pleural effusion and ascites is been very common with the acinobacter and klebsiella in indian nicus that is what also we documented so what i saw that the babies in the septic shock in india by the echocardiography we saw that there is a high cardiac output there is a secondary pulmonary hypertension bidirectional pda we have a vasodilatory shock and third space with ventricular dysfunction these are the parameters documented by various studies by our team and that is what we came to the conclusion that oh what we need to also work on that one yes volume is important in these babies we know that the volume is important aspect but along with volume what i need to use dopamine epinephrine norepinephrine or vasopressin what are the drugs am i going to use so as you we all know i don't have to go into the physiology or pharmacology you all know as a dopamine is a fantastic vasopressor because of alpha receptor but the problem with the dopamine is it also increases your pulmonary vascular resistance so very important concept please remember dopamine is good in improving your system vascular resistance but dopamine also increases pulmonary vascular resistance hence we have stopped using dopamine in our unit for septic shock in the last 7 years and we i'll just discuss about that the another drug as you know is a uh, adrenaline yes again good vasopressor good action on the heart definitely we have a combination of the action that's one drug yes very useful but what what we are trying to use we are trying to use a drug which is a combination part is a not adrenaline because if you see the adult literature and pediatric literature not adrenaline is a good drug for them but we don't have data about the preterm or in neonatology of not adrenaline and not adrenaline is a fantastic alpha one and alpha two receptor and that not adrenaline increases your svr but the beauty of not adrenaline is that through alpha two receptor it releases the nitric oxide synthetase 
and it decreases the pulmonary vascular resistance. So what does it mean? In vasodilatory shock with pulmonary hypertension, when you document by this echo, this noradrenaline is a fantastic drug to act on peripheral vascular resistance and to also act on the pulmonary vascular resistance. And hence, we have started using the noradrenaline unit since 2015, and we have been very happy to work on that noradrenaline. And this is what you all read, neonatology questions, very nice book of cardiology. And that book also, you see now that the septic shock has a high cardiac output vasodilatation. Hence, the volume and vasopressor is the treatment of choice. The vasopressor, nor if print would be the drug of choice, is the first choice due to the superior vasopressor effect and potential benefit of pulmonary vascular resistance. So that's a very important, that was in 2018. I told you that we started in 2015 because of these research trials. And we also documented the use of noradrenaline. Dr. Rima, again, the DM candidate, she has documented that use of the noradrenaline in late onset neonatal sepsis, gram negative sepsis mainly, where you have vasodilatory shock, pulmonary hypertension, hypoxia, hypotension, high cardiac output, noradrenaline definitely improves your blood pressure. It decreases pulmonary hypertension. It improves your oxygen index and lactate. So that is what we have documented and that paper again into the publication. The same thing we have taken one step forward and we wanted to compare them these two drugs. A small study observational, basically the RCT as a pilot study. Again, the third year candidate Dr. Rima has done adrenaline versus noradrenaline because we wanted to see whether there is any difference between these two drugs. And the good part is that, yes, there are a small number of babies. We have 40 babies. But in that 40 babies, what we came out is that the response to the adrenaline and noradrenaline is similar. There is no deterioration because of the noradrenaline. That means noradrenaline is acceptable drug in neonatology. What is there? And now, now she's exam going, hopefully, once this completes, we will able to publish this one also as one of the article which we were planning to submit for general ultrasound. So that's the one more thing. One more thing is one of the fellow Dr. Ankita has documented is that these babies of myocardial dysfunction, can we use milrinone? Because we have less data of milrinone. We have a good data of the vitamin, but can we use this milrinone in sepsis babies who have myocardial dysfunction. So we saw that for pulmonary hypertension, high output, vasodilatory shock, volume norepinephrine. But can I use milrinone to act as an inodilator? And hence, these bioventricular dysfunction using milrinone improved the OI, improved the baby's, basically the pulmonary hypertension, ventricular functions in the 48 to 72 hours. Hence, in our unit, most of the time after the functional echo, we end up with combination of noradrenaline plus milrinone. But again, it depends upon your echo report, what we see. So that is what I'm trying to say that we saw this one septic shock, warm shock. We have hypotension and vasodilatory shock. That is where we are working as a noradrenaline as vasopressor. We are giving this noradrenaline to improve the pulmonary hypertension. While milrinone helps for myocardial dysfunction as well as for pulmonary hypertension. And hence, we are trying to use these two drugs in this deadly, in our unit, we have definitely the Klebsiella as the major bug. And occasionally we also get Acinobacter. So these are the ones what we saw in our day-to-day -day practice. And we are working on the current data, what we got that data. Those people who are interested, this is the book written by our team as the Atlas of Neonatal Functional Echocardiography. Those uh, want, please, uh, you can send SMS or email to us, uh, we will sort out. This is another book which was written in 2016 by our team, including Dr. Mohit Sani and Dr. Kushar. Uh, currently, the copies of this book is not available, but will be available in future. The same baby, same baby, if you see the lung ultrasound, the lung ultrasound has shown the straight sign, lung ultrasound has shown the hepatization, and abnormal pleural line, that's a classic pneumonia. So the baby has a septic shock, including the lung involvement. So that's hepatization with a shared sign. So the lung ultrasound has helped me that the lung is also involved. 
Multi systems are involved. Immediately, we have to do the lumbar puncture in this baby. For that, just simple spine screening in the form of vessels. Just put a linear probe, see the spine, document where are the vessels, and do the lumbar puncture in this baby. That's the role of ultrasound to avoid traumatic taps because you want a correct one. Once you see that lumbar puncture, naturally the cells were high. Ultimately, you have seen immediately the baby's cranial ultrasound. This baby has a very dilated ventricles, ecogenic ventricular margins. You see the ecogenic material inside, and that's nothing but the ventriculitis. So, what does the ultrasound has told me? This is a multi system involvement. This is a septic shock, including the lungs and the brain and other organs. And you might require antibiotics for prolonged duration. And this baby's prognosis is bad. You have to counsel. And during counsel, that helps. This is hardly 10 minutes of ultrasound or less than that, what we could able to see. Another baby, this is not same baby, but we have diagnosed the brain abscess by ultrasound. We monitor the brain ultrasound by serial monitoring. That was the Burkholdt area brain abscess, which was again published in IGP. This was the another baby. You can see it by cranial ultrasound. You have diagnosed this one. Just watch this one. This is a subdural empyema. This baby, which is a subdural empyema. So what does it mean? You don't require all the time MRI. You can able to diagnose a good resolution probe. This is a fantastic simple probe where you can see the, the coronal and sagittal views with a nice subdural empyema also. Naturally, drainage and treatment is long, but that is required. One of our DM fellow, Dr. Rameshwar, has documented that the resistance index in this baby. And what is noticed that those babies have a reverse flow into the anterior artery. When there is a reverse flow in the anterior artery, these babies are problematic as compared to the absent or as compared to normal. That means those babies of reverse. They have worse prognosis. And the reverse or absent is because of bidirectional TD. So that is what we also documented and published in NNF, Journal of NNF. The same baby you have done the hip ultrasound and documented as hip collection. So, friends, you can also see the endotracheal tube. This baby required intubation. You, you do the arch view, that's the arch view, that's the RPA, that's the aorta, and upper border of the aorta, that's the endotracheal tube. So this is the endotracheal tube in this baby, which you confirm the position. You don't have to wait for X-ray. Ultrasound has confirmed the endotracheal tube position. In the same baby later on, you put a pick line and you confirm the pick line in the IVC. You don't want in the RA. So confirmation of pick line position. So that's where another study done by, again, Dr. Rameshwar, the point of care ultrasound in sepsis. Does this point of care ultrasound is helping in sepsis babies? What is documented is that the brain ultrasound was abnormal in around 40 to 45 percent of babies. Heart was abnormal in almost 80 percent of the babies of sepsis. These are the culture positive sepsis of 67 babies. Lung was abnormal in 30 percent of babies, and abdomen was abnormal in 10 percent of babies. And 40 percent of babies required change in management. So huge number. So dear friends, this is very important in your day-to-day -day practice, which you change the management. And you have to require that one. So see this one baby, one baby, you have eco report in your hand, which is naturally high potential, high output, pulmonary hypertension, vasodilatory shock, ventricular dysfunction, third space loss. Naturally, what we are thinking as volume and not adrenaline, along with milinone. But not only that, we have screened the brain, lung, and hip. We thought about antibody duration and prognosis. We saw the line position, endotrical to position. Pick line confirmation, site of lumbar puncture. So many things we have done by one thing. So many information we got in one case. So that's what I'm trying to say that this is very important for all young guns. You all have to learn this as a stethoscope. Yes, I told you inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. The best neonatologist, those who have inspection capabilities. If you ask the seniors, they will say, this baby is not good. You are correct. This baby is not good. But along with that not good, we require this modality in our day-to-day -day practice. Those who want, Dr. Rima Nagpal has written this nice article for critical care medicine 
point of care ultrasound imaging in sepsis. It's a review article. You can go through that one. It's available freely. The second case, how the ultrasound helps, as you all know, this is a meconium stain like a baby. X-ray is severe meconium aspiration, high frequency ventilation, 100% oxygen, PO2s are less, mean blood pressures are less, or poor perfusion. That's a common scenario, as you all know. But still, naturally, the ECHO has shown severe TR jet. You see this severe TR jet. And this severe TR jet, pulmonary pressure is calculated to be around 67, very high. Normally, you can take up to 35. So right ventricular systolic pressure 67 is huge pressures. Again, this baby has a bidirectional PDA. That means the baby with the bidirectional PDA, it's a marker of pulmonary hypertension. This baby also has subcostal view PFO, which is also bidirectional PFO. So what does it mean that? The shunts are bidirectional, pulmonary pressures are high. This is a classic case of, naturally the septum has shifted. This is a classic case of pulmonary hypertension. So when I say this is a classic case of pulmonary hypertension, naturally my management also works on that pulmonary hypertension. So whenever you say that, do I need to give the inotropes as a dopamine, epinephrine, noradrenaline, melinone in this case? Because the echo shows that there is a pulmonary hypertension and the ventricular functions are normal, you can correlate and think about the drugs which will improve your systemic pressure and which will decrease your pulmonary pressures. We all know this theory but we have to document. And the ECHO immediately says that, that documentation is very important that, oh, I need a drugs which are vasodilators and they are acting on the cyclic GMP pathway like a nitric oxide or sildenafil, which is phosphodiesterase five inhibitor. So the ECHO has informed us that, oh, act quickly, work quickly, think quickly, and accordingly work on that one. I don't have to tell you about the role of sildenafil. You all know, about usefulness of sildenafil, but only thing is that be careful about hypotension because sildenafil also does the systemic hypotension. So that is the that is the what always be careful. Your blood pressure should be okay when you think about using sildenafil. So on that basis, on that basis, one of our DM candidate, um, Dr. Chinmay, he has done a thesis on oral versus IV sildenafil. Because we have a data of IV sildenafil from Western culture, but we don't have a comparison data of oral versus IV sildenafil in mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension. So he has taken the cases of mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension in late preterm, early term, and, uh, and the term and post term babies. Naturally, the sample size was less, but it's just a pilot study. What he has shown that the babies with the oral sildenafil were more sick babies as compared to IV sildenafil babies. And actually, both are equally effective. We are using we are using IV as well as oral sildenafil in India, but there was no data about comparison of this oral and IV. So Dr. Chinma has compared this oral versus IV. Those are there, even though there were sick babies in oral sildenafil, the response was better by oral sildenafil or similar response to sildenafil with a lower complication rate. IV sildenafil has a hypotension in the four babies. That he has, uh, he has submitted this article to BMC Pediatrics uh, the last month. Hope, uh, let's see about the future aspect of the article. That is the comparison of oral versus IV sildenafil. One more study, one of the DM candidates doing is Dr. Aditya has oral sildenafil versus oral bosenton in mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension. Because naturally, in severe, you have to jump to the nitric oxide that's there. But if the nitric is not available, you have to think about these drugs. And that's why comparison of oral versus IV, oral sildenafil versus oral bosentan just is trying. One more data he's trying is mild to moderate preterm BPD babies. That means chronic pulmonary hypertension babies, where he's comparing oral versus IV sildenafil or oral versus sildenafil versus bosentan oral. But that's a different part. This is uh, this is a chronic pulmonary hypertension that babies. We all know about the role of nitric oxide. The case what we discussed. The units where nitric oxide is available, fantastic. You're using nitric oxide, but nitric oxide is actually, as you know, is useful in 70 to 75% of babies. 30% of babies will not respond to nitric oxide, hence you have to have other options also. And you know the role of nitric oxide in the various scenarios. So this is the protocol. Now, as you all know, the neonatology questions and cardiology is the book. 
The next edition is due by November. And this time, the editor of the book is Professor Martin Cloco and Professor Patrick. And they have requested our team to write a chapter about hemodynamic instability in low middle class income countries. So Dr. Nagpal, Dr. Mohit Sani and our team, we have written this article as a book chapter. And what we suggested that in pulmonary hypertension, definitely the stabilization, functional eco role, surfactant therapy and nitric oxide first line, but definitely think about sildenafil and bosentan, which is in the ICs. Other parameters are not available yet. And when there is a myocardial dysfunction, think about melanoma. That's a, that's a flow diagram we suggested for that uh, book chapter. Hopefully, the books are going to be out. Those six editions, as you all know, those people who are doing DM, these are the books for very important books, Neonatology Questions book. And these will be by October or November this year. The next edition is due. The next case, 20 beaker, 800 gram. Naturally, the insurer CPAP. At 48 hours, oxygen requirement started increasing. Hypotension, wide pulse pressure, prolonged capillary fill, acidosis. Naturally, you have done the echo. The echo shows this three leg view, classic PDA, classic large PDA, but only observing PDA is not essential. Only just measuring PDA is not essential. You need to see the markers of pulmonary hyperperfusion. That's LAO ratio. There are 10 markers. And the markers of systemic hypoperfusion, there are four markers. So what does this echo has shown? There is not only the PDA is there, but the PDA is making complication. By these, by these assessment of duct, assessment of marker of power circulation, assessment of marker of systemic hyperperfusion, by these all markers, what I just told, it is not only the documenting duct. These are the 16 markers of the duct what you should document as the DM candidate, DNB candidate. It's a mandatory, please don't jump. There is no shortcut. And this baby has a clear cut hypotension. So what do you want to use? You want to use this inotrope? But before the inotrope, what is most important is that the treatment of the duct, which is more important. What are the protocol in your unit? Think about that ibuprofen or paracetamol. What is available in your unit? So, the most important thing is that the preterm, extreme preterm, early targeted echocardiography, early therapy is useful to avoid complications of a pulmonary overcirculation and system hyperperfusion. That is where your functional echo helps. The next case, again, 30 weaker, 1 kg, insure CPAP, but baby has a little bit of, of color. This off color blood pressure is just borderline 30, 31. For 30 weaker, 30 is acceptable, but you prefer about 35. So just okay blood pressure, acidosis, and high lactate. Base is minus 10, lactate 4.1. This baby's SVC flow showed very decreased flow. This is a classic decreased SVC flow VTI. The normal SVC flow is more than 40 in the first 24 hours. After that, mostly 70 to 100 ml per kg per minute. So this, this, is, the, this is the normal SV, uh, VTI, that's normal. The one which I showed you is the abnormal SVC VTI in this baby. Naturally, you have to calculate the VTI and diameter to calculate that. So with this abnormal blood flow, what you are going to use? Are you going to use dopamine, epinephrine, dopamine, or hydrocort? That's why you want to see this baby as immature myocardium. Naturally, that immature myocardium has a problem with the systemic blood flow. Issues with the pumping, issues with the contractility has been documented by that echo. Hence, you need to think about the drug which acts on beta receptor, which acts on the contractility, which is inotropic drug. And that's why the echo has helped that this baby has a decreased cardiac output. Echo has shown decreased cardiac output and that's why the role of the dopamine, which is acting on the beta receptor helps. If you see the comparison of the dopamine and dopamine, RVO and SVC flow, the RVO and SVC flow has better with this dopamine as compared to dopamine. Same thing about SVC flow, comparison of dopamine and dopamine, you see that 35% versus minus 1%. So another study done by one of the doctor, Dr. Kamkar, he has 
Now we don't have data about mildew in Italy town. In such first 24 hours, we have 44 patients data about mildew known from the world, which are documented in pulmonary hypertension. Can I use mildew known for such immature myocardium in the moderate, late, and very preterm babies? Hence, he has taken these 30 babies without sepsis. With high base excess and high lactate, with problems of the immature myocardium as a low topsy, low FAC, and low fraction shortening. And then use the mildenone. Naturally, the year ratio was less than one, both sides. Use the mildenone. And by using mildenone, the base excess improved, lactate improved, OI improved, ventricular function improved. And since last one year, we are trying to use mildenone rather than dopamine, dopamine in our unit for these transitional circulation babies. Definitely, we need more data. That's what that's what another paper again submitted to general ultrasound. Definitely, we, we need a more data, Indian data. These are the preterm babies, but do we have a similar data for growth restriction babies? We need to do those other the DM candidates who are listening. Think about mildenone for growth restricted babies. That could be another research trial can be taught. So that's what I told you that the ECO has thought about the low systemic blood flow, low cardiac output. Naturally, we need to think about the drugs which are acting on heart in these cases. Now, let's see another case. This is a 38 weaker perinatal depression. In the cities, these things have come down, but in periphery, still we have high perinatal depression level. That means we have still perinatal aspects are high. Again, baby is ventilated, borderline heart rate, borderline blood pressure, poor perfusion, acidosis. And this baby has very, very poor contractility on the echo, very poor contractility. FS is hardly 16 to 17%. That means ventricular dysfunction massive. You see this one. On the visual, heart is not able to contact at all. So this is very poor contractility with the TR, with the MR, with the FS is so problematic. That's a plaque view with the poor contractility. So what, what this case has told us, this is the normal FS. This is the plaque view with the normal SA, and this is the abnormal FS with the 20% or 22% FS here. In this baby, if you see the RI, the RI is 0.5. So problems of the heart, problems of the brain. You can think about the prognosis. You see the vasodilatation. You see the increased blood flow. Naturally, you have to use therapeutic hypothermia as early as possible, but you can also prognosticate such babies on the basis of cranial ultrasound, on the basis of echocardiography. You see the right ventricle output in this baby. This baby's right ventricle output is only 75 ml per kg per minute. This is the normal VTI. Those who knows the echo, this is the normal VTI laminar velocity more than 0.5. When the velocity is less than 0.5 meters per second, you are in big trouble. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I must thanks to this uh, cute young future neurotologist who is attending the class. Uh, thank you. So uh, 75 ml per kg per minute. And this is where normal VTI. So this is what this is what we need to calculate the cardiac output in these babies by functional echo. And by calculating the cardiac output, you can document the babies of asphyxia. They have hypotension, they have myocardial dysfunction, they have pulmonary hypertension also. So by this echo, definitely you can think about the drugs which will improve your contactility, which will improve your cardiac output, which will improve your myocardial dysfunction. Again, the drug which improves is this dobutamine or milinone. That's where we should think about those babies of myocardial dysfunction, and that's how the echo helps. These are the cases related to echo, what I have shown you. Now let's go to the next 10 minutes about the, which are also important aspect, I know. Uh, this is a 26 weaker baby, which is outborn. Unfortunately, we still get such babies. This is the third child, two previous girl child. This is a male child, unfortunate problem of India. That's the, that's the, X, uh, that's the X-ray, that's the echo. Yes, little bit poor. White out lung, I'll come to that white out lung. Naturally, everyone will jump and give the surfactant. That's the, protocol. But in this baby, if you see this baby's brain ultrasound, which is a 26-weeker, not received steroid, came at six hours of life, 
and the lung cranial ultrasound shows this massive periventricular hemorrhagic infarction. Now tell me how many times you will do surfactant and continue the therapy of this baby becomes very problematic. This is a prognostic. You know the outcome is bad, mortality is high, morbidity is high. Be careful, think properly. Think properly, such babies do we need such babies in India? That's why ultrasound is held. And we have not gone ahead in this baby in spite of insistence of parents. We counsel them, please think properly. That's why the role of the ultrasound. Naturally, you know the cranial ultrasound is useful for IV screening, diagnosis, critical assessment, for post hemorrhagic anencephalus, for Dopplers, for infection. These all cranial ultrasound. I think we all are good in cranial ultrasound. Everybody is doing good work in India about cranial ultrasound. This is a protocol written by our team published in Indian Pediatrics about the babies less than 28 weeker, where to screen. Babies between 28 to 32 weeker when to screen, 32 to 34 weeks when to screen. Naturally, the simple protocol, what I try to tell the people, if you are a machine, please utilize without cost, 0, 3, 7, 14, 28 before discharge. For 20 to 32 weeks, at least first ultrasound in one week, four weeks to six weeks, that's okay. But surprisingly, what we saw, because most of the societies, even NNF, when we were written the guidelines of NNF in 2010, we said less than 1.5 and 32 weeks, let's put a cutoff. But then we have done the data about the ultrasound in moderate and late preterms. One of our favorite, Dr. Om from Nepal, he has documented that in India, moderate and late preterm abnormalities are very high. Those where Lopgar score who requires ventilation, who has comorbidities, these babies are suffering more also. And a lot of large group of infections we are diagnosing these babies also. So think about, we have to think like ROP. ROP were made to less than 2 kg. Similarly, we have to think in India as a multicentric data collection about moderate and late preterm of cranial ultrasound. And we might have to do these babies cranial ultrasound as a screening. That could be the another thing which is there. This is the this is the NNA protocol written by our team in 2010. This is the IAP textbook. You all know that's a chapter written by our team. And this is a review article on NNF uh, journal we are written. Those who are interested, this book is available, Atlas of Point of Care Cranial Ultrasound. Again, that's my, I think you have my mobile number or email ID, you can go through that. Another case, which is unregistered, 35 weeks, not cried, intubation delay room, hypotension, poor perfusion, severe acidosis, echo showed severe dysfunction. Brain is okay. But the lung ultrasound done in mid axillary line, that's the kidney, liver, and lung, the lung ultrasound shows massive fluid in this baby. Unregistered hypotension, massive fluid, you see the X-ray. Classic, classic fluid, classic fluid effusion, immediate tapping turned out to be the chylus required oclotite. So diagnosis helped by the lung ultrasound and dear friend, lung ultrasound is a boom. Every month you will find one article on lung ultrasound. I don't know, but 50% of our X-rays have reduced in our NICU because of lung ultrasound. You will also have to work on that and hopefully we can reduce this radiation. You can easily immediately diagnose in, in probably 10 seconds or one minute about RDS or TPM. Naturally, the commonest findings you see in the RDS is a subpleural consolidation, pleural line abnormalities, and white lung. Sensitivity specificity is high. When you see such, when you see such patterns of when you see such patterns of the pleural abnormality and subpleural consolidation, naturally, this subpleural consolidation is nothing but is nothing but the RDS in this baby. This is the pre-surfactant and this is the post-surfactant. There was no A-lines, reappearance of A-lines. That is the classic thing what we documented. That's the role of lung ultrasound. Professor Daniel Luca from France, he has, they have done a lot of work on the lung scores and you all know the lung score importance. When you see the lung score naturally more than eight, that baby is immediate candidate for surfactant therapy. So that is what lung score, if you repeat the lung score, we don't wait for 12 hours nowadays for second dose of surfactant. We repeat our lung ultrasound at six hours 
and if the score is more than again 10 then we give second dose but one of our dm resident and one of faculty dr suprabha and dm kandra dr pari they are doing the lung ultrasound score in indian babies hopefully we should be able to compile the data this year and we will have our own data collection as you all know the pneumothorax is one of the diagnostic which is the deadliest complication in icu but the lung ultrasound is the best to diagnose very high sensitivity high specificity that's lung point is there or disappearance of lung sliding absence of pleural line naturally it's a whole big session there are four five sessions on lung ultrasound but this is how you could see the barcode on mo so that is what we called as a lung point that means the point between the a lines and the point between the b lines that's the lung point what you have seen so many times and this is what you can see this side is a b line this side is the ais and that's the lung point this is the area of pneumothorax in this baby and also you can see about you can see about the seashore sign or the stratosphere sign because of the time i'll not go in depth but this is how it works so what i want to tell you that the lung ultrasound is very important for definitely the rds dt and meconium for pneumonia for effusions for drainage of effusion and for pneumothorax in critical condition so lung ultrasound is a big thing so that's another chapter book chapter in the iip clinical textbook on the lung ultrasound cranial ultrasound cardiac ultrasound written by our team i think you have gone through if you not you can go through that book chapter which has all components of lung ultrasound this is the book written by our team on the point of cranial to lung ultrasound again those who wants please contact our team we will try to provide you guys that's the book about lung ultrasound written along with my mentor professor jan klemek from sydney that is what we done another case 27 weeker 800 gram delirium cpap insure eco brufen day 11 naturally full feeds but baby deteriorated on day 22 distension apnea hypotension thought about sepsis but along with sepsis you see there is a this is the gut ultrasound with the liver ultrasound this is the liver ultrasound showing the portal vein gas this is the portal vein gas there is ascites and on the gut ultrasound we could see the nematocysts so the gut ultrasound is coming out in a big way in the last 2 3 years those young ones definitely they want to work work on the gut ultrasound one of our fellow doctor aditya working on gut ultrasound in sepsis perfusion about thickness about fluid collection nematocysts portal vein gas these are the points he is documenting on gut ultrasound which are useful in our day to day practice so friends what i have covered what i have covered is a functional echo in depth i have covered cranial ultrasound lung ultrasound gut ultrasound these parameters i have covered let's see about the lines there are there are more important points remaining also the lines are very useful in neonatology without lines we can't survive the baby less than 28 week hence putting the lines and confirmation line position is very useful by by the focus and hence a theme is that seeing is believing that means you see then you believe and that is the role of these lines confirmation of line position insertion of pick lines diagnosis of all fluids and therapeutic drainage of these fluids is by the focus this is a simple example you see the line which is the low line and you see the line which is in the heart that is a subcostal ivc view if i show you the video this is the peristernal short axis view and this is the mercedes benz aortic wall and this is la and in this la you see this line is in the la that means line comes from ivc ra efo and la that's very common try to learn this thing about line confirmation this line requires pulling out for 2 cm here the line is actually in the subcutaneous you see this line here this line we were not able to have a blood flow but when we did ultrasound this line is subcutaneous mal mal tract which is by line pick line naturally you can identify the vessel you can identify and put a pick line by identification of vein and artery as you all know the vein is collapsible and arterial doppler versus the venous hump which is very useful while putting the pick line very useful when you are struggling especially when you are putting the um, naturally the saphenous short saphenous or the femoral line that time this is very useful to put line on 
one of the important thing rare complication nowadays but it is a complication this is the baby who had you can see now the heart very poor contracting but along with the heart can you see this massive pericardial effusion because of the pic line migration of the pic line and this is the pericardial tamponade immediately diagnosed and drained and naturally that's a normal post pericardial tap what is you could see in this baby life saving life saving pericardial um, diagnosis pericardial tamponade and tap similarly you can diagnose the pleural effusion i shown you that and you can also tap the pleural effusion by ultrasound you also diagnose the ascites and tap the ascites that's the procedures what are useful for ultrasound in our day to day practice the simplest thing is a baby is lot of time hypoxia and they are not passing urine or the babies with decrease in output just put a suprapubic probe and just see the bladder if the bladder is full full you are okay otherwise you will require some other management options that is the role of suprapubic bladder also suprapubic bladder aspiration or confirmation of the urine culture that is what is useful in this cases for spa one more thing our team has done in 2016 along with professor martin proko that we have designed this protocol for a babies who are deteriorated what are the things we should see these are the things for the cardiac ultrasound we should screen these things naturally the effusion output filling pulmonary pressures for cardiac ultrasound bleed and dopplers for lung pneumothorax effusion consolidation for abdominal ultrasound fluid and bowel wall nematocysts and portal and gas for lines confirmation of position and this is accepted in ccpu and they are uh, they are using i think professor martin clocko has utilized this one in their day to day practice and that's what happened on the similar basis the 15 faculties we have come last year and we have written the crashing infant protocol i have represented asia and that is submitted again to european journal of pediatrics hopefully it's been there for last 6 months hopefully it should be out in the next few months that's protocol similar protocol of a crashing infant and ultrasound role of ultrasound now friends i have explained you all these things i explained you lines and procedure what about research i think you all want to more work on research my humble request to all of you please think about research because that is the future of india when we see about the research we tried in our unit also a lot of other things along with this research what i have shown you we have also done this systemic review recently one of our fellow who is now in the perth dr chandrarath he has done the systemic review on does abnormal doppler on cranial ultrasound predict disability in infants of hie and definitely that was turned out to be good so that's that's a that's a ultrasound review this is the framework again 15 consultant from the that's that's a team of us we have written the framework for focus which is published in european journal of pediatrics this is a uh, one of the fellow dr bhavya has done her dm thesis and this is just published today hemodynamics parameters of delayed core clamping in term units that's hemodynamics of term units comparison with ag and hga another article accepted by dr arjun is a ventricular function in a term growth restricted babies he has seen the ventricular functions the another work done by dr nishant who is now in the ems nagpur he has shown the cardiac output in the growth restricted babies dr chinmay um, uh, he has work on cerebral hemodynamics uh, pre transfusion and post transfusion similarly pre and post trans partial exchange transfusion is done by um uh, dr reema and dr aditya that work is going on we have done the surveys in india about the focus naturally lot of units are using focus lot of dm units are now already have ultrasound machine so focus has become a part of uh, uh, day to day practice that's a survey of the focus that's a focus uh, survey of the functional echo which was in 2015 that time also the people have started using the functional echo and friends with this background yes focus is very important but for that we require proper training proper accreditation proper ownership it's very very important it is not one day thing it is not one class it is not one session it is a continuous learning i started my journey in 2002 actually my thesis of md thesis was cartilage damage of knee joint that was way back in 96 97 
and that way i was using cartilage uh, cartilage measurement of knee by ultrasound that's where i generated my ultrasound journey but actually we started in sydney in 2002 and i came back in 2007 in spite of working since 20 years i still feel i need to learn more so be careful that it's a learning process it is gaining the experience and achieving the competency it is not a shortcut don't don't say that okay one day one course that's not the correct we have taken a lot of workshops in india almost 52 workshops by our team as you all know last year we have utilized the covid times and converted that to the online modules a lot of you have joined and i'm very happy that almost 800 delegates attended from 12 countries for those e modules last year on the same basis we have done the workshops in dubai in myanmar and online workshop for sydney and uh, uh, oman team and the uh, the sri lankan team so that is our aim is to spread this focus in the asia and middle east that is what uh, day to day practice we are working on that spreading of this one on the same background last year we started the six months upgradation thing people should learn more people should act more and doing a lot of mentorship about these people we started this new focus concept and we have we have finished the first batch of uh, 25 young guns and they are working as day to day basis and they are doing lot of images the second batch is ongoing those 25 young guns are still working with me and i have selected the the next batch of third batch which is going to be commenced from july and that has been work uh, getting a lot of good feedbacks a lot of people have a lot of question marks in their mind how this works on online but definitely with such a nice fantastic team members young people i am also feeling day by day enthusiastic on working on those parameters about the new focus working on these ones but friends be careful there are limitations most important limitation is please please review 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 discuss those images discuss those videos it is highly operator dependent last week only sunday hypoxic baby one of my fellow who was such a fantastic fellow such a fantastic dm candidate such a does nice eco and he said sir the eco is normal baby's po2 is 50 saturations are ready for we said let's review again and that turned out to be cardiac tpc so it's a highly operator dependent please please be careful can generate the misleading things also always take help of cardiologist we are not cardiologist we are not radiologist we are the physicians which ultrasound will help us naturally the pcp ndt you all know the rules i don't have to tell you about those ones and the training is important so this is the most important slide what you all saw the ultrasound as a stethoscope used to for critical assessment of pericardial tamponade pleural effusion ascites ivh pneumothorax pneumonia for screening of ivh pvl hydrocephalus pdap ph and nec for procedures all the taps pleural peritoneal pericardial taps suprapubic tap confirmation of line position like uac uvc endotracheal tube pick line or gastric tube also and i told you please concentrate lots and lots on research you will enjoy that research and definitely good for publication also because there are a lot of new things coming out the routine things yes you can do that one but when you have new things it will be good beneficial for all of you i think with this i'll stop here friends thank you i have taken 5 minutes more than my allocated time but uh, uh, thanks for your patience um um, um uh, thank you um, manoj back to you thank you pradeep it was a wonderful uh, lecture as usual uh, just on a lighter note india is teaching the world uh, uh, about focus this is no exaggeration because i have a first hand experience yesterday when uh, and we were uh, hosting the learn from the legend session professor vivek narendran from cincinnati he was mentioning that his unit that is the second largest unit in us Uh, as far as the babies, uh, the Ch Cincinnati Children's is a la big name in US, and then they were not using focus until one of the uh, st students from here. He was from PGA. He went there 
and then he started training them that's how they started so india is a, is leading this and then the what a uh, no there is no bigger name than pradeep as far well as this is concerned it's his passion i know him for a long period and then so whatever he has said he is from the, is so passionate about it leaving that aside now come to the science behind this now uh, it, uh, the session is open for discussion uh, there is one question in the chat box uh, i would just ask that and then if there are no questions i'll ask you some questions so yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, the collapsibility of the ivs ivc yeah. is sometimes yeah, yeah. Uh, thought of as a surrogate marker for giving fluid so what is the evidence behind it yeah, yeah. and then how do you i am recommend doing this yeah. so uh, one important thing about ivc if the baby is ventilated this marker is out from your discussion so be careful that if the baby is ventilated you cannot correlate that ivc diameter ivc collapsibility only one thing you can comment probably along with ivc if you do hepatic doppler the same place you get hepatic doppler and if you get your ivc dilated with hepatic doppler bidirectional you can comment this baby has a pulmonary hypertension so actually i use the ivc for diagnosing pulmonary hypertension rather than fluid part but if the baby is non ventilated but which is very rare in, in neonatology or baby is not on cpap which is also rare which is bad baby so yes very very limited data about ivc hence we don't use ivc as a marker for preload rather than ivc we use the kissing sign what is called as eyeball sign that means four chamber when the ventricles are meeting each other when the ventricles are kissing each other that is what we can call them that this is the baby who is in hypovolemic shock but remember lot of babies in the neonatology they are not hypovolemic once you give that 10 20 ml once you are okay with that so you are on a better version about that one so my role for ivc is a different i told you that if it is a dilated non collapsible with hepatic vein doppler which is a bidirectional we diagnose as a pulmonary hypertension rather than preload problem perfect so the learning curve is there the long learning curve and then not only that you learn and then you need to be backed by evidence also so yeah. uh, uh, so uh, uh, probably the, uh, the, uh, okay well, let's go on to next question Sha uh, yes shalin wants to ask something please unmute yeah. yourself yeah yeah uh, so actually uh, thanks a lot manoj sir i completely agree with you that uh, uh, in the west uh, as such the in, i'm i'm like uh, right now interacting from canada mount sinai hospital so over here there is only one institute which has a dedicated neo focus program now during our session uh, dr uh, suryavanshi mentioned that uh, the future of focus in india would be research so what kind of research profile uh, would help us in you know coming out with better papers so would it be a msc in epidemiology or msc in uh, statistics or msc in cardiac physiology if pertaining to functional cardiac echoes so which of these is, would be more beneficial and collaborative for coming out with good research papers in india um shalin i think i think you are the spot on there uh, fantastic now see whatever the course of statistics whether you do the msc in epidemiology masters in epidemiology that is that is very useful but along with that if you could able to do the at least one year training or fellowship of hemodynamics that will be good for your cv or that will be good for your own research because for doing the research you should have a basic knowledge of that hemodynamics now what you have you have knowledge of you have knowledge of neonatology you have a knowledge of basic research which already you are doing fellowship but if you have additional knowledge of the hemodynamics along with that research then it will be very good for your future research collaborations future research organization that will be the better option so i think i think the what i think most of you know that those people who are already dm or dm in neurology along with that if you have a research additional background naturally your cv improves and you will take out whether it is western culture or indian culture people will take you more in that parameters Okay. Right. Now let us go on to some clinical question. Now this yes. I think was covered previously in your in your lecture, but then again, which this is a debate anyway. Like you uh, again the same thing, PPH and due to increase pulmonary blood flow through PDA. Now,
now which drug to manage see whenever you are whenever you are saying that pphn now first of all find out what type of pphn you are doing that is what i told you that whether you are dealing with uh, pphn with the shunts pphn with ventricular dysfunction or pphn of a duct dependent lesion also pphn also duct dependent lesions are also there so naturally what happens when you are dealing with the classic pphn what we called as the pulmonary pressures are high septal shift trj shunts are there which are bidirectional or right to left vasodilatory therapy is the most important when you are seeing the vasodilatory therapy you need to work on that definitely if you have nitric oxide or available cell nitric oxide then that is the best one now you say that if it is a lv dysfunction you have to clear first improve the, the lv dysfunction and sometimes you might use but not not commonly you first improve the milone by and then after 4 to 6 hours these vasodilators that will be the protocol for this one yeah great yeah now uh, another question on vexus protocol usefulness in uh, neonates as far as fluid assessment and uh, fluid restoration uh, in sepsis shock i i don't know this protocol i think uh, dr vanita can update that i i'm not a pediatric person so uh, i have uh, that they can our manoj can update i i have less knowledge of this vexus protocol i i i am i am also the only thing what i know i heard of vexus protocol but that is a standardized protocol for all the i where i do not think it is validated for neonates yeah, because right. their physiology hemodynamics is totally different yes pradeep yeah that's what i said i don't know about this one uh, because I'm, i'm out of pediatrics for now so many years so Anyone can update. I'm happy to learn. Okay, another, yeah. another question. Uh, uh, Forty days old preterm, uh, severe gram-negative septic shock without significant echo finding. Role of sildenafil. Don't use sildenafil in and out. <laughs> <laughs> please, please think what you are dealing. Please say what you are what you are actually going through. That why the why the shock is probably there? what uh, she means is uh, when you do not have nitric and you are, have to deal with such a scenario, septic shock PPHN. Okay, okay, okay. Probably probably that type of the scenarios you might you might first of all improve the blood pressure by improving blood pressure. A lot of time such drugs what I told you not adrenaline or adrenaline they will be helpful. But if you if you suffer then probably. Uh, that's the last choice for me as a surgeon. I think I don't use that as a routinely in that scenario. My my scenarios are volume, ventilation, perfusion, uh, good ABC, along with good inotropic support. Like I told you about noradrenaline or adrenaline and associated milinone. That's my own uh, practical. I don't use surgeon. I feel in septic shock. I must openly say that uh, that is what is thought process. All right. Now, uh, Dr. Murugeshan. So, how do we interpret cardiac parameters in fluid overload? As most parameter load dependent, this has been discussed. Yeah. Anyway. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Actually, the very thing again, the dilated ventricles, LA, LV. That's the uh, you see the quite a big dilated ventricle that will give you the volume overload pictures. At the same time, you could see the ventricular function by doing the tricuspid wall uh, and mitral wall Doppler. That will give you easy idea of volume overload. And similar question is spilling over in various forms. The vasodilator uh, uh, increasing more pulmonary blood flow. Then how will it help in case of PPH and due to increased blood yeah, flow? Yeah, that's same thing. That's what I explained you that the echo helps you which type of the problem you are dealing. You are dealing with high output. You are dealing with low output. You are dealing with ventricular uh, normal ventricles. You are dealing with abnormal ventricles. You are dealing with the um, more blood flow, less blood flow. That will guide you. I have given one scenario to you guys. It is not always one scenario will work. It is a various scenarios you have to find out, and that is what you have to see each case as a different scenario and the work on that scenario. Yeah. That is probably the reason why the uh, learning curve is so sharp. Yeah. And uh, like it is like uh, the, uh, there is a lot of subjectivity. Now, yeah. uh, on this context, can I ask you, Pradeep? Uh, can yes. we add uh, elastography in uh, cranial ultrasound, uh, like in adults, what they do? You know, like uh, uh, has it been validated in neonates? Not validated, but that is, I think, the things which are not validated, it is time to learn us. What are not validated? Yes. Right? I think even though ten, ten babies, twenty babies, what, what we, what, what is the advantage to all of us? Let's see what is the advantage. 
we all have a lot of patience the western people are not going to do the work on septic shock western people are not going to do work on these uh, babies of growth restricted it is our role so um, the we have so many institute now in india so it is our role to do our own research even 20 babies and everyone gets 20 20 babies in each unit at any given time everyone has 20 40 babies so small small studies will again helpful for us rather than waiting for the things outside world yeah so probably this point has been uh, harped upon so many times by pradeep now and uh, this is high time that we uh, think of uh, i mean ha- develop that research culture uh, then only this uh, this will happen and then the fields where there are neonatologies not all uh, black and white there are lots of shades of gray and yeah. where you no know, like uh, only you know some validation and some research will help us in uh, for, uh, moving forward now again the similar questions are coming up i do not yeah. know whether you know, like uh, yeah. choice of anotropes according to functional echo uh, yeah i think i have covered that the case basis and that that's it that's it covered it all yeah. yeah how to determine left ventricular wall stress in elbw babies okay. okay i think that's a different whole session but just yeah. in short just in the short about what happens in the preterm you can't only rely on uh, you can't rely only on the fs and ejection fraction so along with that you will see the velocity fiber shortening vlc up and from your uh, ejection fraction fraction shortening and vlc up you can calculate lv wall stress and we have a nice chart about correlation of lv wall stress with the preterm and definitely the lv wall stress is a one marker japanese people are using quite a well they are they are using in elbw baby especially the baby is 23 24 25 weeker in india we don't do 23 24 weeker but this it does help in i, I it is a whole whole separate class how to do what to do how to measure what to measure but yes it does measure and it does help uh, and that's a part of the protocol again the question says that how to calculate vlcf that's what i said it is a part of our advanced eco workshop it's not a, it's not easy to explain in one class uh, it's, it's a lot of classes so i, I think uh, dr aritra ray i know all all you are eager to learn these things it's not feasible to me explain in one sentence it is it is a whole class on that yeah okay since there are no questions i would just uh, take a minute of liberty and yes. then uh, inviting all of you uh, after three weeks to kerala trishur for the Uh, uh, international neonatology summit uh, we are hosting iap neocon 22 you have three workshops on uh, ultrasound itself one uh, functional echo uh, led by uh, uh, dr soni uh, and dr surya uh, sorry uh, uh, pradeep is coming for something else and uh, Do- dr mohit saini then we have a um, scan workshop uh, from university of calgary which is almost full if anybody is very keen we can find one or two seats uh, for that that's being repeated two days and then we have a uh, lung ultrasound as was being mentioned repeatedly by uh, pradeep lung ultrasound is the only thing that is not standardized if you really go by that but then there is a uh, the group same uh, d lucas group they are coming for a half day workshop so that is there on uh, so the dates are 26 27 for workshops and 27 28 29 for cme so i would personally invite uh, all of you if anyone is interested please contact us um, you can contact any uh, any of us uh, we would be uh, happy to send you the details that is just a liberty i taken pradeep now uh, do we wind up or uh, yes, anything yes. more no no already we are 15 minutes late yeah we are <laughs> yeah. we are late actually yeah. <laughs> thank you so thank you so much friends for um, and, uh, this is something like as i began by saying this is a bridge between uh, knowledge and wisdom you know everything how to do but you you don't know how to uh, actually put into practice so the wisdom comes from these sort of skills that you develop and uh, this is something that is a, uh, all of us know the future stethoscope so let's all learn it those of us who have not learned let's learn it it may not be part of the curriculum today it will come in the future with that uh, we we'll close the session okay. thank you thank you manoj thank you, thank you pradeep Bye. good night everyone good.